Hello, and welcome to Context Free, where we talk about programming languages. Today, I want to cap off my recent videos where I've been discussing interfaces and abstractions and so on. I want to discuss explicitly the issue of dynamic versus static dispatch and abstractions in the sense of a dynamic abstraction is one that gets resolved during runtime, and a static abstraction is one that gets resolved during compile time. Let's go see what this looks like in C++, for example. For this example, I'm going to use shapes like circles and rectangles. This is a very common example for polymorphism and inheritance. And each of our shapes is going to have an area and a perimeter, which returns a double. I could have also used the standard concept floating point if I wanted to support single precision or other precisions as well. And so for my implementations of this concept, I have a circle which has a radius, a rectangle which has a width and a height. And note here that I have area and perimeter defined that return doubles, and area and perimeter defined. For my circle, it's pi r squared. For perimeter, it's 2 pi r. And we have the proper implementations for rectangle as well. So down here, we're going to use it. We're going to make a circle of radius 1 or radius 2.5, a rectangle of width and height 3, or rectangle of width 4 and height 6. So just so we can make any number of these things. And notice I'm using these designated initializers from C++20. These are barred from previous C standards. And that's why I've separated out these struct definitions from these other uh, class implementations in order to be able to use designated initializers, uh, which you can't use on types with virtual methods otherwise. So here I've got this, uh, these circles. I can print out the area and perimeter of a circle, and I can print out the area per perimeter of the circles. And this is the generic or polymorphic function I want to discuss today as my example. So here I have a shape auto, which means it's going to automatically pretend that I wrote a template. This is one of the features with concepts in C++ 20. When I say concept name auto, it's the same thing as saying I had a template with a type that conforms to that concept. And it automatically creates that template for me. So I can call anything that conforms to concept shape, I can call the area divided by the perimeter. And so this function here basically defines the compactness of a shape. If I have a long winding fence, that's very low area per perimeter. Uh, versus if I have a compact shape like a, a circle, it could be much, much higher area per perimeter. And so I can go ahead and run this example here, and we'll see that for our first circle, which is a unit circle, we have area pi and perimeter 2 pi for a fraction of 0.5. And for our first rectangle, which is 3 by 3, we have 9 divided by 12, or 0.75. Now, the th thing is, this is great and all, but what happens if I wanted to have a heterogeneous collection of these shapes? Now, I could make a standard vector of circles, and that's great, but I can't do the same thing with both circles and rectangles unless I have some kind of abstraction to apply to them. And that's where dynamic abstractions make sense. And so I have this class here for the virtual methods for area and perimeter, and I have inherited from this in each of my circle and rectangle types and overridden those virtual methods. And so I can go ahead and run this now. And when I do this, I can see the ratios of all of these coming out from the same collection of types. When would I want a heterogeneous collection of data? Well, for example, in the case of shapes here, maybe I want to have some kind of scene graph for some kind of vector graphics library or application. The number of other situations could apply as well. So that's what I have going on here. And I see the example coming out. Let's look a little bit closer at what's actually happening inside of this function. If I go ahead and run it from this perspective, I see that the type inferred to be here in the first case is specifically a circle, and in the second case, specifically a rectangle, and in the other cases, it's a dynamic interface implementation. So what I had originally was a polymorphic function area per perimeter that then gets monomorphized by the compiler uh, to a specific version for circle, rectangle, or dynamic shape. And we can actually look at this also using the readelf uh, utility in Linux that can give me the specific symbols that are inside of my executable. So I see area per perimeter of rectangle, circle, and dyne shape. And so every time I use this for a different kind of type, I'm going to get a new monomorphized version of this function. And note also here, we can look at the sizes of these things. So for the example, in the circle case, we see it's size 16. In the rectangle case, we see it's size 24 in the dynamic type shape. In the dyne shape version, we see it at size 8 just for the pointer itself. The question is, why are circle and rectangle size 16 and 24? Because I clearly see my circle data has only got one double, should have been size 8, and rectangle has two doubles, should have been size 16. Where did the extra 8 bytes come from? And that has to do with how C++ does its virtual uh, method dispatch. 
when I have a class that has virtual methods on it, it doesn't just have the fields I define, but also has a pointer to the virtual table inside of that. So instead of 16 bytes, I have 24 bytes. The virtual table tells where to find these functions at runtime when I'm doing dynamic abstractions. Let's see how this contrasts with how things work in Rust. So in Rust, all the abstractions are built around the concept of traits uh, instead of the two things we had in C++, which were concepts and virtual methods. So in the case of C++, for example, I'll argue that going forward, perhaps you should define things primarily in terms of concepts. And if you need the dynamic version, you can also have a dynamic as well. This right here, this function doesn't care whether it was static or dynamic. In Rust, we'll have traits that also don't care whether it's static or dynamic. And it's handled a little bit differently. So we have an area and perimeter. Each of them returns an F64, same thing as a double. And then I have an area per perimeter method here, which divides the area by the perimeter. And then I have a circle structure. And in Rust, you always implement your traits separately from the definition of your structures. And then I have a rectangle structure, and I have an implementation for the rectangle. And down here, I have C1, C2, R1, R2, just like in C++. And I can print out the area and perimeter. I can print out the area per perimeter. I can make vectors that are of the same type and have copies of my circles inside of there or I can have dynamic uh, trait implementations and have a heterogeneous collection just like in C++. And then I can loop over my shapes and print out the area per perimeter of each. So if I run this Rust program here, I'll see the same thing I had in the C++, 0 0.5, 0 0.75, 0 0.5, 1.25, 0.75, and 1.2. And that's exactly what we got out in the Rust version as well. So the thing is, what's happening differently here? And uh, to look at it a little bit closer, let's go on ahead and add some extra debug information like we did in C++. If I go and run this here, we'll see in one case that we have our circle and our rectangle. And then for the vector, we also see circle and rectangle. By the time it gets to this method implementation, it's already figured out what type it is. And that's why I don't see this dynamic shape involved in this particular method call. The other thing worth noting differently here is that the pointers are size 8 like we expect. And furthermore, the sizes of the objects themselves are what we expect. The circles are 8 bytes, and the, sh the rectangles are 16 bytes, like we might expect to have happen. Now, the thing is, uh, this right here is not really exposing all the mechanics of what's going on because of how it's getting called. Just like we could in C++, we can also make an external function uh, in Rust that's generic on some kind of uh, uh, type parameter and it's going to conform to the trait shape. Uh, now, by default, your generic functions in Rust require that the size of the types be known at compile time. This is the default. By putting a question mark in front of here and an explicit bound, it means that I can have dynamically sized types as well, which is what's going to be required for these uh, uh, dyne shape, for this dynamic shape uh, trait implementation like we saw down here. So let's go on ahead and, first of all, prove that it works with a new version. Actually, it won't work yet because I can't call them as methods. I need to explicitly pass them in as arguments at this point. And the same thing is going to apply down here. If I'm going to use the new function instead of that uh, embedded function that we had inside of the trait previously. Let's go ahead and run this. And we see the output we expect to see. Let's go on ahead and expose the extra metadata. And we'll find something interesting happen here. That in the first two cases, we see the same thing we saw before, that we have a circle and a rectangle. But now, when I ask what the type is for the dynamic shape, I specifically see dyne shape. The other interesting thing that we see happen here is that the pointers in the first two cases are size 8. But now, in the second case, while the shapes are size 8 and 16, like we expect for circles and rectangles, all our pointers are size 16. This is called fat pointers in the sense that in Rust, instead of having that V table pointer inside of the structure itself, it instead has it inside of the pointer when you have a dynamic uh, trait pointer. And so one pointer is to the data, and the other pointer is to the V table. And so because of this, uh, we have a more flexible system. On the downside, if we had a very large collection of these dynamic shapes, we have twice the data required to store those pointers versus what was required in C++. And so uh, there's pros and cons to this. And this uh, create V pointer, which I haven't used, its goal is to make it so that you have large collections of these dynamic pointers that you can store them more efficiently.
Anyway, so we got to see an example of how things work in Rust versus C++. In the C++ case, I'm going to argue that going forward it might make sense to define your abstract types in terms of concepts because that can apply to either static or dynamic abstraction. And uh, in the Rust case, of course, you're just going to use traits. So we can see the different methods, the different pros and cons. We also can, for example, compare what we had between the Rust and the C++. And it's actually interesting in the end, in my particular example, how similar they turned out between the C++ side over here and the Rust side over there. And uh, I hope this has been useful for everybody. And we're going to move on to new topics next time. Bye, all.